eight. Is there any more space? All right. Um, first of all, a great welcome to you all. It's a, it's a wonderful pleasure to welcome you here. And also, I'd like to thank our, our panelists for coming. Uh, we've managed to assemble a, a really stellar and interesting group. I think the major debate we were trying to uh, raise public and get going is something like the following. In private, we all know that actually the level of cuts the, the, the coalition government is enforcing, the level of cuts that the Labour Party would enforce, are strikingly similar. Uh, if one believes Paddy Ashdown, and I tend to, I think the figure that he articulated that Labour would be cutting £17 out of every 19 that the coalition government is cutting is broadly, I think, where the truth lies. What I, what I think is interesting is, okay, there is something problematic, there is something worrying about the type of cuts when they fall on the poorest and when the way in which they fall on the poorest dis disables or prevents them from in any way improving their condition. Now that's disturbing not just for obvious principles of morality, it's also because it runs counter essentially to our IDS's vision as well. So the key question is, given the nature, and I don't think we should avoid recognising where we are, <coughs> given, the, given the nature of the current fiscal position, how do we create not just an austerity plan, but a growth plan that in some sense doesn't hit those uh, who most rely on the state, but also, and in another way, recognises that some of the levels of state provision that we uh, grown used to, don't necessarily serve the interests of those of the poor, and actually we need to think of new and innovative ways in which we can have a welfare that genuinely changes people's outlook and genuinely tra transforms their situation. So that's all summarised under the heading of, um, of a responsible uh, recovery, or a recovery that in some sense tries to bring about what uh, I think many of you in this room would be committed to. So to aid this, uh, I'm the chair, so I won't try not to speak so much anymore. On my, on my far left, I have Lord Glassman, raised at the peerage uh, of Stoke Newington and Stamford Hill. Um, and uh, Morris uh, has really been one of the decisive thinkers in trying to broker not just new labour, but also a, a radical settlement that actually speaks to people across uh, the current party political spectrum. Um, we also have Sir Robin Wells, which I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you, Robin, Mayor of the London Borough of uh, Newham. You've been in local government since 1982. Sounds like it. No, no, no. <laughs> but you still display energy and verve, which I think is, uh, is a great testament, really, given what local government has, has been going through. And um, we also have, and we're very grateful to Polly Toynbee, uh, who obviously, um, as you all know, is, is a columnist at The Guardian. But I think Polly, in many ways, has a, a structural position in English public life for arguing for those for whom actually there's less and less people who will argue for, that, for a certain section of our society. So it's a great honour uh, to have her here. Unfortunately, um, Kate Green can't join us because she had a bereavement, so we, our best wishes to her uh, in, in such times and our condolences. So, um, without further ado, what I'd like is ask our speakers to speak. Um, they'll speak for about five minutes. I anticipate that um, we'll be joined by the PPS to um, Chukuma, hopefully at some point. Uh, shortly, that's Simon. But without further ado, um, Morris, uh, the floor is yours, and you may stand if you, if you wish. Thank you. So, uh, comrades, I think. Uh, so, first of all, Philip, thank you for the for the invitation. I've always avoided doing anything with less public uh, feeling that I was in enough in enough trouble. Um, as it is, um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's a sign of the times that I can tentatively um, move, move into this space. But to commend the work, to commend the work that you've done. Um, so I think what I want to what I want to talk about now is that I think that now we are in a position where Labour can genuinely reclaim itself and reclaim um, the ground 
that it should um, never have vacated. And the first thing, obviously, to say um, about this agenda is that it's got to be built on labour, it's got to be built on work, that, um, that the argument about the market and the state has to be uh, broken in a very significant way. And I think that now we have the organisational um, concept, which is um, One Nation Economics. And I just want to say a little bit about One Nation Economics um, because it's a very distinctive labour contribution to a very long-standing debate about what constitutes the common good. So, um, and, and to say that there is only going to be a, a, a common good society, there's only going to be a, a transformation, as Philip puts it, when we actually recognise the dignity of labour, when we recognise the fundamental truth of our own tradition, which is that value is generated fundamentally by labour, in relation with capital, in relation with technology, but the lunacy of the last 30 years and the particular amnesia lunacy of new labour was to imagine you could create value without the workforce, that it was managerial, it was technocratic, it was a unilateral form of management in the public and the private sector and it's led to um, a very bad outcome. So what we have to do is think about what, what it would mean to have a, a one nation economics um, uh, a labour vision of that and I think that the first place to start is, is with the fundamental insight of a long commonwealth tradition of which labour is part that there has to be a balance of power in every institution so the unique feature of the, of the English tradition is that the king ruled in parliament that it was neither popular sovereignty on the one side nor divine right of kings on the other occasionally we had to kill the king to remind him that that was the case and, uh, and then after that sunk the bit invite them back in in a subordinate position um, the point being is, is that there has to be a balance of interest and what's been lost in economic governance is entirely um, the balance of interests so what we had was a, a form of management without outside any form of accountability and that led to what we've got, which is, and what particularly happened in 2008, which was the systematic cheating, um, exaggeration, um, really l systematic lying, which wasn't called by anybody. And, um, and that was to do with the lack of the representation of labour within the corporate governance of firms. So if there's going to be a common good, if there's going to be a one nation um, labour vision for the economy, it has to be, with every difficulty that this implies, a common good between capital and labour within the firm. So that means a quite drastic reorientation of, um, of, of managerial power within the private sector. It also means that we have to begin and begin urgently a proper constructive conversation with the unions about that partnership that there isn't ever going to be a real Labour government that's going to nationalise the industries and um, unconditionally give Labour trade unions power without responsibilities. So there's going to have to be a balance of power within the firm. And then we have to look at uh, another old concept, which is which Ed mentioned yesterday in his speech, which we need to develop um, urgently and radically, which is that the vocational economy. I thought that was a, a superb section of the speech, is that one of the problems that we've got is, the, is that if you're a lawyer or if you're a doctor or if you're an accountant or even if you're a dentist, um, you, you work through an apprenticeship system and your labour market entry is conditional on having gone through that. But if you're a plumber, an electrician, a carpenter, a cable layer, um, working class people obviously have to work in a free market. So there's a guild economy for the for the partnerships, for the professions, and there's a free market economy for the vocations. I think it's absolutely essential that we establish a vocational economy where there are self-regulated institutions, democratic institutions, which uphold good practice, and that there is a form of moral regulation in the economy and a systematic growth of the skills necessary to flourish if, if you hold the view that I assume we do, that labor is a source of fundamental source of innovation. So that brings together there is a tradition of work that's absolutely vital for modern innovation. And without labelling the point, I think that the German economy is a very good example of how that works out. The third issue, which is absolutely fundamental, which is on Robin Wells' doorstep, really, 
is the issue of the domination of internal investment by the City of London. That the best value and all those things led to a pattern of internal investment that, which was in fact linked to the international economy, to the maritime economy rather than the territorial economy. And what we had was the erosion of capital throughout all the regional all the regions and the depletion of the regional institutions. The classic case in point being the Northern Counties Permanent Building Society established in 1834, which existed steadily growing for 160 years, mutual, fundamentally part of the labour movement, um, which became an institution you might have heard of in 1992, which was Northern Rock. And look what happened. And that was another depletion of local capital assets. So regional banking, the idea that you, uh, I think 5% of the bailout should be used to endow regional banks that are, can't lend outside the county lines, where you can actually build long-term stable relationships with, with businesses and, and with families. So um, a balance of power in the corporate governance, a move towards vocational institutions and the vocational <coughs> economy, regional banks. And the third aspect is uh, community land trusts which is, um, I think, a vital transfer of assets to, to local people. When I last looked, under the heading of portfolio rationalisation, there was a selling off of £10 billion worth of land from the, pub, from the public sector to the private sector. Now, I would argue that this is hugely important for Labour to campaign on. When we went on the forests, when we went on the allotments, we actually generated a lot of broad-based popular support. But more than that, if you knock out the freehold cost, that halves the cost of house building, and then you can meaningfully talk about raising of resources um, for houses. And Dover Port is another, it's not just about housing, we've got a situation at the moment where the freehold of Dover Port is held by the state, the leasehold is held by a very nasty company called the Dover Harbour Board, so you've got the ultimate sort of nasty public private partnership going on there, where the Harbour Board basically are sacking the workforce, maximising their advantage in order to send it, sell Dover to, of all people, the French. Um, now, call me an unreconstructed populist, but I think we can do something with that. Um, and, and, uh, and in fact, the campaign down in Dover is being led by the Unite Union. And what's interesting about that is that's the first time that a major union has actually committed itself to work representation on board in partnership with finance, with the uh, with the financiers and the local town. So the community land trust is a third workers, third, third uh, finance, third Dover town. It's a very original model of development. But what it can do is transfer assets in trust. And there, I think there is a meaningful uh, parallel to be made with John Lewis. So there can be a genuine um, renewal of a very depressed part of the South East. I think it's very important to say to everybody that in looking at the north-south split, there are very depressed regions of the south, regions that Labour needs to win in. And I think it's very important that we go that way. So, um, so the redistribution, so we've got to grasp the possibilities here. The old models have run out, both the, I would argue that the state is social democratic and the free market model are, are out of road. So we have got a moment now where we can redistribute power where value is generated by relationship, skill, energy, by people. And that they can only do so if they can break free of the um, managerial constraints that lead to the stifling of initiative and the stifling of people's creativity. So the third aspect, as you've got someone, sort of Wells from, from, from New York, who I know hasn't always had a very happy relationship with community organising, is... Um, is to think about how we can hold as well and renew the democratic aspect. But on holiday this year in Sicily, I thought it was a good occasion to reread Machiavelli. And, um, and you know, it, Sicily is very appealing to me because you know it is organised. <laughs> you know, children can play safely on the beach. And. Um, uh, and while I was reading the discourses, I came across this idea that's been negated with the tribunes. And what used to happen in the tribunes in Rome, and this lasted for about 500 years, it was a very long-lasting institution, is that the people would actually appoint the consuls, who were the local heads of the administration, in public assembly democratically. It used to happen once every four years, and then they'd be renewed. So I think we've got to think about public assemblies where the three candidates aren't interviewed by five people in the room, but are interviewed by 5,000 people. 
and, and some, find some way of democratic accountability, because the lack of accountability in the public sector is as much a concern as in the private. So roughly what I'm saying is that there has to be redistribution of power in the economy towards labour within the framework of the common good. That is the way that you will balance the idea that you can have recovery that is, that is only in the interest of capital is actually won't work. That this is the decisive moment where we can give genuine meaning to um, one nation labour economics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morris. I think the most interesting thing Morris said amongst the whole raft of it interesting remarks was the notion of moral regulation of the economy. And I, and I think the notion of the moral, what type of society we should be, also includes the notion of reciprocity. And I do want us to try to address the austerity, the welfare issue, as well as arguing for the type of responsible capitalism I think we all want. Um, Simon, um, thank you for coming. Thank and uh, <coughs> sorry if you were informed it was later than planned, but you've arrived and we're very grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'll start by making an observation as it's on the Community and Local Government Select Committee and everybody on the panel that's at the poll have been called before that Select Committee in the last few months and, and given evidence. I don't know what that tells us, but uh, it's relatively interesting, I think. But, uh, let me start. I, I want to touch on three things. One about rebalancing the economy. Secondly, in terms of uh, areas that deal with difficult issues. And then thirdly, I want to say a few words about public service uh, values and politicians now of all colours uh, talk about uh, rebalancing the economy and they are usually talking about uh, sectoral change, you know, uh, less emphasis on financial services, more emphasis on manufacturing and I agree with the need to rebalance the economy in that way. It's a failure to have addressed that which is what did for areas like Rochdale. That's why uh, there are various problems in places like Rochdale because uh, we didn't have a more balanced economy. Uh, so I agree with that. But I also think that we need to rebalance the economy in terms of geography. And again, that's a fairly obvious thing to say in terms of north and south divide. And I think that uh, it still exists and it's probably being uh, emphasised even more because of some of the policies uh, of this co current government. But I also think we need to rebalance the economy within regions and, uh, and particularly within sub-regions. So if you take uh, Greater Manchester as the sub-region, the city region, call it what you will, I think there's a need to rebalance the econ economies that exist uh, within that sub-region. So peripheral towns like Rochdale uh, are disadvantaged and have been for some time and have been under uh, Labour governments, never mind under Conservative governments, and a lot of emphasis gets put on regenerating the core and the centres of cities, which I understand and you know I, I enjoy Manchester like many other people, but there's been a disconnection in terms of infrastructure, in terms of being able to get from Rochdale, it's not just Rochdale, it's Wigan, another town, Bolton, and other towns around within the sub-region. That could be, uh, Blackburn would be another example, like, uh, just outside of the uh, local authority areas. But they should be better connected. And I think more needs to be done to rebalance uh, the economies within sub-regions, never mind just in terms of uh, north and south. Uh, so much better infrastructure. Getting the train from Manchester to Rochdale, you know, this one's happened in the south of England, I have to say. <coughs> one train an hour, you know, that, 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 uh, of an evening. That can't be right if we are expected expecting Manchester to help create this uh, renaissance that benefits uh, commuter towns, peripheral towns, call them what you will, that are not far from the centre of the city itself. So that, that's a key uh, issue I'd like to make. I mean, finally, in terms of that, I'm a great advocate, and it's not very fashionable uh, within political circles, but I am still, and I've been for many years, a great advocate for a regional political dimension. Uh, regional assemblies, I still think, is the right way forward and I think it was a mistake to get rid of the regional development agencies and I could speak more about that. But one of the, I think the principle of regional growth fund uh, is a good initiative uh, but a failure to have regional development agencies is, has meant that the government's been completely unable to get the money to where it needs to be. So they were, they were, and they were particularly good 
in ensuring, if you take the North West Development Agency, they were particularly good in ensuring that the money got to areas that tend to be neglected whilst all the money were being sucked into places like Manchester and Liverpool. So, so they played a significant role. Let me move on to the second point I wanted to make. Uh, and, and very much drawing upon Rochdale, but it, applaud, it applies to many other towns and cities across the United Kingdom. And I've sometimes described uh, Rochdale as being a magnet for the dispossessed. And the reason I make that point is that in, in terms of three issues. First of all, uh, historically, homelessness services have developed over many years in that town. Uh, and so it becomes a magnet for homeless people. So very few homeless services in Bury or in Oldham. So Rochdale's carrying an, an additional burden. And I've done lots of research around homelessness. You see that in Doncaster, a few homeless services in uh, Barnsley and Rotherham, but lots in Doncaster. Lots of homeless services in Blackburn, but not many in Accrington and Burnley. So you get these beacons that are particularly good at delivering homelessness services. So we've carried uh, a, a, an extra burden in that regard. Also in terms of asylum seekers, Blackburn would be another example, where over the years we've took a disproportionate number of asylum seekers into Rochdale. And thirdly, and, and that has been most highlighted, uh, we have a disproportionate number, uh, the second highest in the country for private children's homes in Rochdale. So we have a lot of people coming into Rochdale with a whole variety of different issues. Now, this is the point I'm getting to. We should actually, we should either celebrate that, or we should either create equity uh, and, and get towns and cities to take their responsibilities, or the alternative <coughs> to that is to celebrate these towns. It's not just Rochdale, there are many other towns that carry these types of issues. But we should celebrate it and we should fund it. And we should say this is a beacon authority, it's particularly good at dealing with these types of issues. But you've again got to put the resources into it because these are the towns that are carrying some additional burden and that has failed to happen in some areas. The final point I wanted to make uh, fairly briefly is in terms of public service values. And we, I think there are some uh, local organisations, some local authorities uh, and public bodies that are very good and have excellent public service values but there are many that have uh, very poor public service uh, values where the culture is all completely wrong, where the outlook for the, for the people that they serve is completely wrong and I think we need to do something about that. Uh, the, the biggest example there is the grooming case in Rochdale where you have social services that have the most peculiar view of the girls that they were there to serve that unhealthy culture, how did that exist, how did it develop within a public service organisation? Uh, so I don't think the argument should be much about is it public or is it private in terms of delivery. It should be more about what are the values of public service. And so to conclude then, we need to rebalance the economy geographically, we need to celebrate localities that deal with some particularly difficult issues and we need a renaissance in terms of what public service values are. Thank you very much. Again, I think the, the interesting remark I, I take, I particularly struck by the notion of kind of welfare towns and concentrated welfare, but it is the notion of public service value and the questions one of the questions I would like to ask, is the state the sole repository of public service value? Or can there be other entities, non-state entities, that in some way do public service values better than the state? These are some of the issues I hope we can come to. Um, Robin. Thank you. Um, I should suppose start off by telling where Newham is. Newham stays the Olympics, not if you noticed. <laughs> and can I say to each and every one of you, thank you for the £9.2 billion. Pounds. Money well spent. We really enjoyed ourselves. Thank you. We were a great party. And, and I will just say, it was so good we think we're going to have it again next year. <laughs> same, same again. The only thing I will say, the thing that drove me out the wall was that the game makers were the most magnificent, just absolutely magnificent. But at the end of the games, I was going, can I just get a wee bit of cynicism? I am British, I have the right to have cynicism. <laughs> and occasionally somebody would ask them a question and say, I don't know, I don't care, go away. Didn't get any of that. And it was very depressing sometimes when you have to high five as you're leaving the park. Did any of you see? I know it's brilliant. But cynicism is our birthright as a nation, and I demand that we, uh, we do that. <laughs> it is not, it is not, not, not. Right. Uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to describe our experience in Neon because I think it's, it's applicable elsewhere and I'm going to try and demonstrate what I think our response should be at the moment. We're all in tough economic times, but the good news is we're all in it together. So, so rich, Richmond and London have had £6 a head cut, so Newham has had £160 a head cut. But it's nice to know that Richmond are in there with us, struggling <laughs> with the cuts that they've got. I, I, you know, these boys, it's tough, tough times in Richmond, as always. Um, <laughs> so I'll talk about the Newham experience, which I, which I think is applicable. And basically, it comes down to this. Uh, with the cuts we're facing, and they're pretty severe, we could salami slice it, we could just make cuts and take out the odd library here or there. But we think you need to have a, a decide your social objective and your priorities. And you need to decide what it is you're in the business of governing for. What is the purpose of a Labour Council? A uh, 61 nil Labour Council, by the way. So you want to come to a nice place where there's no Tories. You die very well, right? We've even got Olympic Party and come and look at it now. So. Right. We've, 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 we've looked at it, and in our view, we, we are looking through our, our priorities and objectives. To, 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 we're working the concept of resilience. Uh, and resilience is about saying, look, as a, a person, you need the capacity to be able to overcome things that are thrown at you. And some of the research says actually that's more important sometimes in academic life. It's the ability it's to be aspirational, it's to be able to do things for yourself. And for the last 50 years, we've cut the legs off people by doing it for them instead of them doing it for themselves. It's about building links from the community. One of the interesting things is, if you only know people who are like you, you don't get the opportunities to be experienced, other views, other ideas, and then also get access to jobs, because lots of jobs uh, work, work through that way, through, through personal contact. And then, then there's economic resilience, and, and that's just getting, getting a job. <coughs> because I do believe in the dignity of labor, and I think it's critically important that people work, and I think it's good, it's good personally for somebody to work. It's good economically. You want to solve child poverty, you want to be solve child poverty, or really get after it. It's for people to work. And so we're very clear that those are the things. Now, that's, that's our philosophy. That's what we believe in. Well, in that case, um, what do we do then? What are we doing to show that in a tough time, we're carrying that through? I'll, I'll give you the kind of example that we put. It's very, quite crash, really. Somebody walks in and says to us, I want more benefit. We're going to say, there's a computer program, we'll show you how to use it. Somebody walks in to us and says, I want the job, we're the best buddies. That's the kind of approach we think we have to do. So what have we done to prove it, right? We set up, five years ago we set up something called Workplace, a jobs brokerage. And we, we built it up with relations with employers. Because employers have the jobs, and we've said to employers, can we present people to you? Now here's the interesting, if we send CVs of new people to employers, 2% get work. But if we work with employers, understand the nature of the job, prepare people and, and then put, put them forward to employers, 50% get work. And last year we got 5,000 people or thereabouts into work, half of whom were long-term unemployed. Give you an idea of the challenge, we need to get 20,000 people in Newham are long-term unemployed into work if we're going to get to London average. 20,000. So 2,500 is a good start, but let's think of a decade of this. That costs us £5 million. Pounds. Now here's a quiz. How much money do you think the government gives us from the work programme to help people into work at that scale? Anyone want to have a guess? Yeah, nothing. Nothing at all. And it's, I guess, what you'd expect from them. The other thing we've done, we've set up something called Skills Place, which works again with employers leading it. Again, we're funding that. And again, we're looking to last year, primarily getting people into initial work, and 1,200 people went through Skills Place, which 40% got work the two or three week course and things, and we knew that half of them would get 40%. Here's a question, the skills agency, what percentage do you think of the people that go through courses and get, get jobs? Well how would we know? They don't count it. They don't know. I had a wonderful story yesterday that when CSI came on the television, loads of kids applied for forensic science courses. Do you know how many forensic science jobs there are each year in the UK? Nine. Nine. Or 40% of the kids in my borough who do hairdressing never ever get a hairdressing job. 40%. Do that to doctors and see what you get. Yeah, it's alright for, for kids in hairdressing. These aren't the best academic kids. These are kids that are doing what we tell them to do. And that's true in so many different courses. So it's, for us it's about starting with the employer. Understand, I think Jeremy's exactly the example. What do the employers need for the jobs they've got? And actually the correct answer is let us understand locally and in a sub-regional basis or a city basis we can do something about it. 
have a Soviet style skills agency from the top and it doesn't work. So we put money into, into the skills place, but we've done other things, right? We, we, we want to reward work, so we've introduced free school meals for every single primary child. And that is directly an investment into people's pocket who are working. It's five million pounds of courses, but we're doing it. Plus, it's not a bad thing for kids to get a good meal once a day, is it? I, I, I don't see a downside to that myself. And to, to, to again, to facilitate support work, housing allocations are now prioritised for people in work. It doesn't cost us anything, but it means we're trying to support people who are working because a low wage, a low, wage, a low uh, if you're working low wages, a low rent's really helpful. If you're not working, a low rent doesn't help us kind of, kind of so much. We've done a whole, a whole raft of things on children. We've introduced every child gets a musical instrument, free, and three years free tuition at two and a quarter million pounds because we think they should be building up the skills to build that resilience capacity. 20% of our kids can't read when they come out of school, so we're putting one-to-one -one tuition into every kid that's a million, that needs it, that's a million pounds. We're introducing every child a sports person because having had that sport, we thought it would be a good idea to keep doing sport. So every kid will this year go to University of East London, we piloted it last year, and we'll be testing what sport the best are. Again, that will probably get, and then we'll help them in the clubs. That costs a million pounds. Even in a time of austerity, you have to commit money to the things you think matter, and you have to have the courage to do that. And of course, I know what you're all saying. Oh, the other thing we did, we had the biggest community festival in history during the Olympics. 800 events run by residents themselves, a million people turning into things. So I, I'm looking around you know, saying, where does the money come from? Yeah? Oh my goodness. Where does the money come from? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So go on, you know, it? Well, the answer to that is you have to make cuts if the Tories, savings if there is protecting our people. And we've introduced a number of things. To, you know, we've said we're only going to, we're going to cut down face to face work. We're going to cut that right back because we want you to be doing it. So, well, you know, we'll be supportive, but we, we want you to try and do things for yourself. We've rationalised our buildings and brought them together. We haven't closed the library because that would make no sense if we have a, a belief in resilience, but we've brought them to one, but they're all still in local areas, there are nine local areas we've divided into, there's still one in each local area, but we bring them together to save money. Um, we, we've looked at budgets for adults, most people are doing that, and independence, and independent budgets save money, as well as being the right thing to do. Um, and in transport, we're looking not to do transport for people, we find a different way to do it, and a different way where people take responsibility for doing it, and again, it saves money. You have to look at the places you can save money. how it contributes to what you're trying to do. And that thing we did, I'm very proud of, we, we spent £110 million on a new building uh, and we'll be able to strike out loads of managers and make, make a lot of savings in accommodation. And I'm really proud that Ike Pickles attacked us on it. Um, so I think that's a badge of pride for myself. Um, <laughs> so, so, yes, we have to be nice to be us more. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to respond, but we, we have a philosophy and a belief of where we should go. We think resilience is right, investing, getting people to do it for themselves, but we're the best buddies. The thing we are planning to do at the moment is an independent fund where if you walk in, if you walk in through the door and, and you can say, I've got something that can change my life. And I'll give you an example. A guy came to me and fought to get his kids through the courts. And he came to me and said, look, I've won. And, and, and we want that, don't we? Fathers still to be in the lives of children. That's something we want, I think. That's something the community thinks is right. And he said, I need a deposit for a two bedroom place. Because I'm only in a one bedroom place. And my answer is, we're setting this up so we can say, there's money, off you go, yeah. And if you pay it back, you can come back again and we'll help you again. We need to find a way of personalising things and breaking the culture down. I mean, you ask why they're all still things happen, because we, we build these cultures of people who, who get into, I think it's too big. I think our service delivery models are too big. And so one of the things we're doing at the moment is, we are looking to break every single service we've got to either individual people or to an area into small businesses and to float them off. Both we think they can go for an hour and try to do other things, but also we think we can then personalise the service in a very different way. Now, we've got 80 <coughs> projects running, we're going to double that. We haven't got anything out yet, so it's just something we're trying to do. Many of the things I've told you about we've done, we're planning to do things, we're planning to move forward. I think it comes down to, in the end, what do we stand for? Who do we think we are? What do we think we're trying to do with, with the residents that live in? And are we prepared to have the courage to do the right things and then take the difficult decisions elsewhere? And I'll leave you with one other thought, which has nothing to do really with what I'm saying. <coughs> the barbarians and their stuff they're doing on benefit is the barbarians. There's nothing you can say other than that. 
the vicious way they're attacking people and, and, the, and the cuts and, and benefits just awful and the community and council has. But one of the things they're going to leave us with potentially with universal credit is the idea that you keep a certain amount of money that you earn, 35%, whatever. Now it seems to me, as socialists, we should say, do you know what, that's a really good idea. I have this great idea that the marginal rate of tax for the highest paid should be the same as the marginal rate of tax for the lowest paid. You know, because otherwise they'll leave the country and go somewhere else. That's what happens. <laughs> if you're very rich, you know, you, that's what you do, apparently. Yeah, yeah, right. Let them leave. But the the issue then becomes, if we have that ability, is that not then? Should the Labour Party not then be saying, if you work, you get to keep more of your money? You don't lose that, and we begin to move towards a system that says we reward work. We still have to have a safety net for people that don't work. We still have to think about how we help people. And there's lots of other things we have, but. Should we not be moving to a system that says we're as fair with people of lower incomes as we are with high incomes? And that, someone said to me, that's going to be very expensive to which the answer is, that's what we do in New York. Things are expensive, we'll do what we think is right, and then we'll find ways of funding it. And I think that's the model that can be applied right across the country. That's superb from Rob, uh, Robin there, really showing how a council can really help deliver the very thing we're talking about. Thank you. Oh. I just want to ask you something. Did I hear, what did I hear you say about Ian Duncan Smith at the beginning of this? About his concern for the poor? I said, I said, that, I said that he had a moral concern for the poor as well. And the, as well some, as what? As well as people in this room. So uh, all I was trying to say is that uh, I don't want to get into this. No, 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 no. I'm not happy to get into it. No, 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 no. All I was trying to say is that I think good people of whatever stripe agree on the need to restore a certain type of morality to what we do. I think mean, Ian is one of those. I just couldn't disagree more. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what he, you know, it was rather like Cameron and the hoodie hugging and the husky hugging before the election. Uh, he came across in this sort of pained saint. Sanctimonious <laughs> way about his deep concern and his uh, social justice mission, or whatever it's called, and it looked quite convincing at first. Um, sort of alliances with Frank Field and such. But what he is, in the end, you know governments and you know ministers by what they do, not by what they say. And if we've learned anything from this government, that's what we've learned. Don't just don't look at their words; just look at their deeds. So actually, their words are now, are now changed too. I don't think we're going to hear we're all in this together again very soon. I think we just need to look. If you're talking about uh, a responsible recovery, uh, balancing economic and social priorities, you begin with the barbarians, as uh, Robin Wells quite rightly called them, to take 18 billion out of benefits, uh, which the IFS respectable organisation says is without international or historic precedent. It's monstrous, enormous, uh, beyond anything, and we've hardly even begun on it. Uh, this last April it was still 88% cuts to go, by next April it's still another 67% uh, of the cuts to go. Um, what it's done, what the universal credit has done is not at all what it's going to do if it happens, not at all what it says on the tin, because it says it will give everybody uh, a better incentive to work, which is good, but that's what tax credits did, that's what Labour did. Not perfectly, there were glitches and corners and because of tapers, it's very difficult to make a perfect social security system. But the idea that Labour wasn't utterly focused on making work pay, uh, on a hand up, not a hand out, and the best uh, uh, welfare, work is the best welfare. These were all Labour slogans. They were, they were just as focused on that. If you look at what's happened on universal credit, it starts by taking £4,000 away from all those families who cannot find work over 60, uh, up to 24 hours a week. If you can't work up to 24 hours a week, Ian Duncan Smith has taken away £4,000 uh, because you do, of what you lose in credit. So when he starts his universal credit and says work pays, that's having taken away £4,000 from those families. 
Uh, and that is an absolute shocker, and he never says it. Because of looking at the way council tax works, yet again, this is taking money away from people, and it isn't at all clear that work for a whole lot of people is going to be no more than 19p in the pound worth. Uh, so simply hearing you say these one things that here are six complicated benefits with great long forms, and I'm going to simplify, and everybody sighs because it's so difficult to understand and says, thank goodness, simplify. is the year and it's going to simplify. Simplify in the benefit system, as often in the tax system, nearly always means less fair. It's a, a rule of thumb. Not always, but usually. Um, so what we're going to have is, at the moment, if it happens, if it works, if the computers work, uh, is a system that isn't really going to be any fairer and starts at much less. But I think if I was looking, you know, Labour looking at where, how you get into the welfare debate, which has gone so much in the government's favour, it is the one po policy on which the government is really popular. Uh, all the polls say so. People actually say they want more welfare cuts because of how brilliantly they framed it. And of course, they have 80% of the press behind them to tell uh, curious anecdotes of bizarre cases that people have then persuaded, persuaded that representative of the whole welfare system. Uh, next April, when the DLA to PRP switch happens, there are going to be utterly monstrous cases of people losing benefits that they desperately need. Families with disabled children, two-thirds of disabled children are going to lose all their DLA. Um, an estimated, with a disability allowance, 90,000 motorability scooters and cars are going to be uh, repossessed. I mean, I think people will be changing themselves. So this may be another U-turn coming up, because I think once even the Daily Mail understands the sorts of stories that, that are going to be there, we may see another rapid U-turn. But Labour should be campaigning on this, because if you ask anybody, who would be your top priority for a state to defend? It would be disabled children, number one. And so I think that's where Labour at the moment should be absolutely targeting its, its attention before next April. Um, the idea of having an economic recovery when you take money away from the people, which is money that rolls fastest and most and most efficiently through the economy, more money you give to people lower down the scale, the more valuable that money is, the more of it stays in this country, and the more uh, will the multiplier it has. Uh, responsible recovery. I think Labour should choose four main priorities. Childcare, getting women into work and combining it with the best possible early years and everything that sure start is at its best, though we're now much being cut back. Social care, uh, the Dilmot report plus more of Burns ideas on, on this uh, when he was last health secretary which is uh, thinking about again, again, get women into work. Unless you can have households with at least an income and a half, they will be poor in, uh, uh, with people middle to low incomes. Youth unemployment, already Labour has said, a guarantee of a job for every young person out to work for a year. I think they should aim to bring that down to six months. Um, and a bill a million homes. This is Patrick Darwin's idea, um, who worked in the in, 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 very close to training um, of the Penn kind of Policy Unit. 250,000 homes a year is what we need. And so to say we'll build a million homes in one parliament, you know, with guaranteed apprenticeships for a, 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 a attached to that, um, again, is a win-win-win system for getting people hired, getting people into work, getting uh, skills training, and then a living wage. In the end, we won't get responsible recovery unless we can stop the divergence of wages. And it's quite easy to persuade people. If you say to almost anybody across the political spectrum, is it, do, do you think it's okay for us to become more and more unequal faster and faster because we're now on an accelerator going that way? Whatever you think is fair, we'd all have different ideas about where we might fix hair, fair or how to define it. Most people are scared of the idea of becoming rapidly much more unfair than where we are now. So let's at least agree to say, fix it where it is, for a start. Well, even that would be extraordinarily difficult and take a great deal of uh, direct intervention. I think a living wage, first of all, 
do a ratio, a norm for what uh, higher up pay should be, uh, a, a establishing a moral norm, if you like, if not a legal norm, uh, of, of some sense of where top pay should be. Um, there is money available. The IPPR and Resolution Foundation have produced a, a very good list. £20 billion pounds from financial transaction tax. £7 billion pounds you can take from higher rate of pension tax relief. One point five from universal benefits, not pensions or child benefit, but that would have already gone. Um, national insurance, nearly a billion. Uh, for those who the better off retired who can be still in work, like myself, who for some reason suddenly are reaching sixty, finally don't pay national insurance anymore. You can take a cap off national insurance, you can take a cap off uh, certainly on council tax, matching tax is two point five billion if you start having proper uh, rates of council uh, tax, but uh, you would bring in much more. Transport, you could pay for much the sort of transport that you need, road user charges. There is money available if you have the political will and if you can persuade enough people that we do want to rebalance the economy in these ways, taking money from those who work fine and taking wealth from those who've accumulated, my baby boomer generation accumulated for no good reason, so I can think buy a modest house and end up being a millionaire. Uh, this is all madness, and I think people know it. And I think Ed Miliband's speech began to turn the argument in a way that will make sense about one nation. And it can be done. Sorry, go on to you. No, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. I'd like to throw it over uh, to, to questions, but in order that we don't uh, all just agree with one another, and I'm sure um, we're all in a, I'm rather struck by, I remember reading a column by Polly on James Pennell's uh, arguments to introduce conditionality into welfare. And I think one of the welfare problems we do have is that in spite of all the money pumped in, so few of, uh, of those on the, on the bottom rungs of income actually got jobs even during the boom. And one of the reasons that it was dysfunctional is tax credits are actually a subsidy for no wages. So it's a very expensive way to fund employers, which is why I've always supported living wage. So what I want to suggest is that we can't go into the 21st century with the, the old standard models of welfare, because far too many of them kept people where they are. And actually what we need to do, and I think what the role that the left should perform is exactly as Robin talked about, facilitating and creating the conditions uh, for agency. And I think then you can take money from the different sources that Polly talked about and broker a new solution. Um, but that's just to introduce some grit into the oyster. So let's have some uh, questions. The gentleman there, the gentleman here, the gentleman there, and then we'll choose uh, a woman, hopefully, if a woman puts a hand up. Let's have a group of questions of three. So if you just introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Neville Gregory. I live a Labour Party member. I live in Sweden, which is in Neville Place. I think the politology should be given the teachers under 10, because I agree with every single word she said. That was fantastic. And I'm not disabled. You know, I get fed up. Just because I don't have a job doesn't mean that I... I volunteer, I get out, I do things, you know. It, you know, it's most upsetting. I'm volunteer at Manchester Park Gallery, I help with the so uh, my social housing provider. I, I write letters to David Cameron. I mean I don't always get a reply, but I do it. So just because somebody hasn't got a job, it doesn't mean they're not contributing to society. Right. And and Can the you turn it, I, I completely agree. Can you turn it into a bit of question, sir? Right, yeah. Um, do you want me to come back to you? Would, would you yeah, like that? Sure. Uh, I'll do that. So. I've just got a question for um, uh, Robert. Um, in, in terms of the, the problems you find with kind of the trap and investment, it's not necessarily kind of. Uh, sorry, uh, you, you're trying to make that investment, but you won't necessarily um, recoup that investment into your own budget. <coughs> And things like the uh, savings on job seats allowance, etc., is it, it, it's, it's going to be a savings for the state, not to use. So how, how do we stop that problem with budget guarding? Because there's things like the, the um, poor quality housing costs, the yeah, NHS, three billion pounds a year. So there's a lot we could do to kind of um, reduce spending for investment, as long as we make sure that the savings are approved by people making investment. Thank you very much. Um, I don't want my question. Okay, go on. 
But the difference between public and private, to me, I, and I want to know if the people agree on the panel with this, you're a private provider of a service. Your, your main function is to, is to make a profit. Whereas if you're a public one, your, your main service is going to give a service to the public. You would the panel agree with this. Thank you. That is incredibly similar to my question. I'm, I'm Michael Payley, I'm a councillor in Wembley. Um, I was going to, I was going to, you mentioned the, the question of can, uh, do public service values have to come from the state? And the answer to that is obviously no. I mean, they're human values. And you also said, can other organisations do them better? And I think often yes. I'm a huge supporter of the cooperative movement. But when it comes to private companies, that's when it changes. You can have fantastic public servants on the front line working for private companies, but someone will start breathing down their neck and cracking the whip because they have targets based around profits. So my question is, do you think that public service values can exist in a profit maximising situation? So, uh, let, let's uh, turn this over to the panel. If you just choose to respond to any of those questions as you see fit. Uh, Robin, do you want to lead on? Uh, yeah. Interesting. We, we, we do something in Congress, and it's probably even better because it's a great point. Uh, we have a new poll, which has about 100 people in it, from half of them are disabled, so we, we take a view that we, we really keep to encourage everybody to work in families are doing a tough time, and very tough time, for being honest. But the, the thing, and I'll come back to that question, the, the investment not recouped the budget, it's worse than that, right? Um, you said that poor quality housing costs the NHS £3 billion. Pounds. Well, we're just about to, to kick up a scheme. We can tell you, right? We're going to license the whole of our private rented sector, which is one third of all the properties in New York, which is like 30,000 properties, which are, to give you some sense of it, we got two people living in a walk in freezer, right? But the good news was the freezer was switched off. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. 38 people in one house, 16 of them kids, is our record. So we're going to use the legislation last year the government brought in, even though it's a bit clunky, to license the whole of our private rented sector. And the result of that should be a much better... We've done our pilot, 25% of landlords will go, we'll buy, or we'll aim to buy those back, that's building an asset base, because I believe that... And we did that, we set something called Local Space some time ago, where we um, invest some of our properties, they borrowed 250 million, we rent them, and we're building an asset base, should be about 450 million in our 10 years, because building an asset base is really important. And I'll tell you one thing I have learned, don't trust government. Uh, our view is get in, build your own asset base, get everything out of the HRA, get it into the general fund, put it where they can, sell it, because our government talked about selling local government assets at one point. Yeah, and that was really not that. So we'll put it where nobody can, can steal it, and then we'll, we'll make sure that generates about this. So, yeah, it drives me insane that we're going to do this stuff in the private rent sector. So it costs us a lot of money and we don't get anything back. We do this stuff on jobs and we don't get anything back. But you know what? It's what's best for our residents and that's what we've got to do. And Total Place was the Labour government's response to some of that. I think it was a really positive step and we should encourage more of that where we're using the money and, and, and passing them around and savings are, are going, to be, be, going to come back to, to, to kind of local area. Last, the second one was public service values. We are setting, we're going to take our services out into small business. Now, if the mutuals, that's great. If the private sector, that's fine. Because what we have to say is, private sector, we're going to be really clear about what we want from you. And the failure to deliver the stuff that we want is unacceptable. I will give you an example of why I want to do this. Our children looked after were inspected. Our service was inspected. Some of our social workers didn't have uh, um, CRB checks. Now who's responsible for that? Uh, HR, the social workers, their managers, the service manager, the divisional manager, the, uh, the executive director, the chief executive, the mayor, who's responsible? The answer is nobody is. And we end up not carrying through the values we believe are right. Far better if I say, I'll let you, have, I'll let you uh, do some of this work, and I will inspect you, and if you don't do it, you're fired, I'll go somewhere else. Yes, I'm going to get it at a good price, but I want to get the service that I pay for, which we know in Rochdale they did not get having paid for that service. So I, I, I just think big bureaucracies don't work right now. Thank you very much, Robin. Holly? Um, public, ser um, public service values, I think it's an interesting question because we're going to see now if, with so many services in the NHS, another maybe 400 put out today, uh, 
to, to the public, to the private sector to bid for, even if in the first place they may be uh, good services. You may get, you know, somebody who provides a life clinic somewhere for something or another. I think um, the danger is of what you then get is that the public capacity disappears. So you can never go back again because the NHS will have actually will no longer do that service, whatever it is, and you can never get it back again. Once it's been in the public service for quite a while, as we know from quite a lot of other things that are privatised, it's usually a cartel of two or three big companies, a circuit capita and a couple of others, uh, pretty much offering the same price for the same sort of service. Uh, and it may not exactly legally be a cartel, but it is near as damn it for an awful lot of them, whether it's, you know, Vieri or rubbish collection or whatever. And so you no longer have a comparator to know actually whether the state would by now be doing that better or not. They may have been a loss leader and undercut in their bid in the first place, knowing that they would then be in a dominant position once they held the contract for a few years. So that's a, a danger. The other danger, I think, is that if you have a large part of, say, something people really care about, like the NHS, that is in the, in the private sector, people no longer have the same trust. I mean, there is rationing anyway in the NHS, always has been since it began, always will be. So people never entirely know anyway whether they're getting the very best of what could possibly, one could possibly buy. But if they suspect that, that they're being denied it because somebody's making a profit, the deal is very different to a sense of, well, that's what the NHS can afford. And I think that's where the relationship changes altogether in ways that become quite ominous, in ways which people then become quite cynical and quite anxious, whereas they're hugely trusting, sometimes perhaps too trusting, of the NHS, that it is on the whole there to try and do its best for you, even if it doesn't always do that. Thank you. I think the the quick answer to your question is yes, I think uh, uh, private companies can have good values and social values and deliver and deliver better values than some public services. I think, I think that is a, a given. I used to be a councillor on Blackburn with Darwin Council. They put some services out to capita uh, and capita overall delivered a very good job, much better than what had been delivered when it were in house. I uh, then moved to Rochdale. Uh, they have a private company in there, New Shell, uh, and the contract has been taken back doing an absolutely appalling job charging an arm and a leg for the services that they deliver. Uh, and they've got put, yeah, that's right, a, a real difficulty. So, but I, I think they can. And I don't think we should also get carried away with this idea that social enterprise is the complete solution to public services either. Uh, we've just spent uh, doing an inquiry with the uh, CLG Select Committee looking at cooperative councils. And, and it's very early days with that sort of thing. And, you know, just on a practical level, I don't know how many people have a, a, an account with the Corp Bank, but people tell me, and I haven't used that one. I mean, it's a fairly crap service to be <laughs> uh, You know, so all, 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 Cooperatives and social enterprises they don't have good values. Morris said that co op are good at burial. Uh, <laughs> but they do recognise GMP trade unions. So, I mean, is it if, interestingly enough, I mean, what Can I say, I've never had a problem with the co op bank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what I would suggest is actually neither the ambition for a purely public service or a purely private service is that radical. What we do if we just go with the standard lines is that uh, we have a corrupt private sector. And, and the public sector we think is moral so we don't reform. Mm -hmm. The real task is actually to use public sector values to actually transform business as such. And I think that's, that's the truly transformative anti-capitalist agenda. And uh, in, that, in that regard, um, let's open it up for more questions. So, thank you. We'll have the lady there. Do we have another woman? Lady over here. Uh, lady over here. So that's one, two, and the gentleman there. Uh, if you say who you are. My name is Benson, your point of view is very easy to mind. I'm both founder of a medical finance organisation and member of the Employee Ownership Association. I felt that Morris articulated the most clearly. Could you stand up please so everybody can hear you? Thank you. I felt that Morris articulated the most clearly the structural problems that are going to impede social progress in the UK, even if there's any problems with 
for the inequality is going to get worse. So my question really is particularly to the Labour group, are you going to have the courage to really tackle those structural inequalities and start doing it early so that you can get over the hump of, oh, you're just unreconstructed socialists or whatever, because there are new forms of ownership and running the economy that can benefit all. But I just think Labour lacked the courage last time. Will you actually take on board Morris's key points and actually try and implement them in, you know, in opposition so that you're ready for power? Thank you very much. Uh, the lady in the corner. Mary Lloyd, I'm City Councillor in Southampton. I've been fascinated by the panel's comments on various aspects. But I want to ask whether any of you have any theoretical and practical advice that you would want to pass on to members of the shadow team, particularly to it, about how we do best trying to get back some of the money that the very rich have managed to pog it away and stash away and it gets more all the time. Because if we genuinely want to make society fairer, we have got to pull some of that off back. What's the best ways to do it? Subversive stuff at the Red's public fringe. Uh, we'll just take the, the lady there at the back. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm Susie Stride, parliamentary candidate for Harlow. I also work for a charity, so I'm not always quick in. Um, um, I also work for a charity in Tower Hamlets that works with unemployed young people. My question is a little bit similar to the gentleman before. Um, it's, do you think there is room for more partnership between the local authorities and the third sector? So it's very frustrating in Tower Hamlets that funding would come in to tackle youth unemployment and the local authority would replicate what grassroots charities were already doing and basically do it in a pretty crap way instead of commissioning it out to third sector grassroots organisations which would do a much better job. And the other quick thing is on unemployment, last week our charity was on page of the evening standard throughout the whole week. Um, it basically, we partnered with them during the campaign to get co them companies to take on young people. We've had 500 calls, RBS and Sachs, offering placements. And I think there's room for creative ideas to tackle youth unemployment, which aren't going to cost any money. It's using the media in a positive way, maybe regarding because of the suit. Thank you very much. And, and because I have an innate sense of fairness, there's a gentleman there who, who I said can speak. So, your question, and then we'll go to the panel. Hi, say who you are. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm John, I'm his Labour Party member. Um, a bit of kind of a, kind of a beat me to my topic, but it's the, we've all talked about sort of social mobility and welfare provision. I was curious what the panel thought the role of business would be in this. Um, you mentioned sort of, a, sort of the transformation towards public sort of, you know, social welfare consciousness. Uh, and how would they envisage this sort of transition being facilitated? Fantastic series of questions. So let me go to Morris first. Yeah. Um, Loads of things. I mean, I'll begin in reverse order for no particular reason, um, and I'm going to be obscure in my answers, so sorry for that. My <laughs> fundamental concern, there's a very good conversation going on with business at the moment. The last year's uh, you know, predatory and productive actually yielded an, an extremely interesting response as the year went on, um, in terms of what are the conditions of, of business. Uh, and what was really interesting, about two weeks ago, just to to share a kind of public anecdote. There was a, an event hosted by the Catholic Church on better business. And there was the head of, you know, um, McKinsey's and Vodafone and Unilever. And what, what was really astonishing with that conversation is obviously the church has a position which says that there should be workers on the board. The church has a commitment to living wage. It's got to be said that the living, that the living wage campaign enjoyed more support over these years from the Catholic Church than from the trade unions, which is an interesting thing to share. Um, and, and also about vocation, and they were really with it. My concern is our conversation with, so business is, and there's three things that we've got to break if we're going to have a winning coalition. We've got to have a relationship with productive business. I think we've got to have a relationship um, with faith. And I think the thing we haven't got, which is the weirdest thing of all, and we just want to share it as a matter of common therapy, what we don't have is a constructive relationship with the trade unions. We're not having a conversation with the trade unions about the role that they're going to play in the renewal of, of the economy, of the public services. What's the, what's the office? And we've got this abusive relationship where we kind of turn up at their conferences and tell them things we don't want to hear, which we didn't help, we don't talk. So what I do want to uh, raise here is that it's absolutely vital that we develop the uh, relationship with productive capital and we also develop a relationship 
I think Labour should really have a relationship with the trade union movement. That should be one of the distinctive things that we do. But because we've kind of avoided dealing with, with the negative issues there, we can't actually push it hard enough so it becomes a positive. And, and that's vital in terms of what Polly was saying in terms of living wage. Li living wage, the, the, one of the reasons we've had to legislate all the time is the lack of power of workers and firms to be treated decently. And it's absolutely vital that there's a renewal of, of, of trade unions. And that kind of um, gets to, to, to Susie's point, and Harlow's obviously a place, Harland of Spurs, isn't it? And a yeah. place I love deeply. Even, you know, Glenn Hodden came from Harlow. You know. I'm not suggesting you should run on that. Um, but what I, what I do think is, is that this concept of partnership has got to be deepened, and it's not about we've got to get off the public private partnership and into a partnership with the workforce on the delivery of things, and you know, on the delivery. So we've, we've got to make this concept of partnership a relational concept rather than a transactional one, and actually remember that nothing functions, um, nothing functions without that. But there is, there is an issue, a really big one, um, which I'm sure Robin knows about, which is that, there is, is that there's a huge amount of those millions for those job creation things. I mean, in London Citizens, a few, just before the Olympics, what we did was we just contacted local employers, as you did. We had we got the faith congregation. So unemployed people in the faith congregation brokered by the imam, the priest, and the vicar. Uh, and we, we generated, roughly speaking, 1,200 jobs that have also stuck at roughly similar rates to yours, relational things. We will vouch for the good, good nature of the person from the congregation. The business are connected to that, and and, and it, was, it was it was sort of forty pounds a hit in terms of the jobs. But when you look at the the enormous amount of money going into those job seeking corporations, I think there's actually a scandalous story there of of, of an enormous enormous amount of of, of waste. Now, when it comes to advice to the two heads, I usually give them different kinds of advice, so it's hard for me to um, conceptualise what that will be, so I think I'll best leave okay. it. Thanks so much, Morris. Uh, Polly's now leaving, so I think a little round of applause. <laughs> Can I just mention that a dreadful Tory brought in a wonderful act called the Public Services Social Value Act, Chris White. And uh, Res Public has been working with Chris on this, and this means that every act of public procurement must take in account of local, environmental, social, and economic value. And we've got a session on this at 6 p.m. in here with Hazel Villiers and Garrett Thomas. So it's central to everything we've been uh, discussing. Simon, would you like to respond to any of the questions that? Uh, Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's way above my pay grade to explain uh, how different things will be under Ed Miliband, but I do get a sense, and I'll be completely straight about it, I, I read David Miliband's support in terms of the leadership, but I, I'm absolutely, I, I have a strong sense that Ed Miliband is determined to have a dramatically different approach in terms of how he approaches some of the issues that are of real concern. So this issue about pre-distribution, I think, is actually quite interesting. The people that I was at Tesco's have just made profit, profits of billions of pounds, and it's the taxpayer that is subsidising that in effect because they're paying low minimum wages, and we're profiting up through tax credits. That yeah. can't be right. And I do get a strong sense that uh, Ed Miliband is, is determined to get on top of it. In terms of uh, taxing the rich and things, I'm a great, I've only been an MP for two and a half years, but I, what I've learned since I've got down there, I'm a great believer in the power of heckling. Uh, uh, in the of heckling. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I've been shouting, tax the bankers. Uh, you don't pick this stuff up on the microphone from heckling necessarily in the, in the chamber and on the TV. But tax the bankers, you know, and I think that, is, you know, I think the public deserves some of that stuff, actually. I think, you know, some payback in terms of what went badly wrong, I think. So we should sort some of the rich out, and there's a lot of any hesitation in saying it. The final point I wanted to make, in terms of the voluntary sector, whether it's social enterprise, voluntary organisations, and it's following on the point that you were making, they're exceptionally good at being creative and imaginative, and you can test out some real ideas. So they bring a really valuable aspect to uh, developing public services because that's where ideas are born and developed uh, with very little money and with volunteers and with, you know, that, that can't be underestimated. Thank you. Um, 
Morris has uh, has asked to make one point, and if I say no to Morris, he'll get angry with me. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, Morris, quickly I mean, in, in, in response yeah. to this, I mean, five percent of the bailout just to go to internal local banks yeah. is, I think, something that we that is really an excellent campaigning issue. As well as Thanks, Morris. Robin. Right, Morris started it, right? Just so we're clear. The Olympic Stadium is for West Ham. When I was asked <laughs> if we wanted Spurs there, I said, no, we want a big team. So I don't have to listen to this nonsense. Well, you started it, right? You started it. Can we have a short, pithy answer? Because yeah, my, colleague, my colleagues are, are gesticulating at me, which means I'm in trouble. The comment from right. Susie, I would say, uh, actually, uh, we went to Bromley Boar Centre in, 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 in um, Dar Hamlet, which was a very, very good, um, great example of good, good, uh, good social enterprise thing. And um, they do some fantastic work, and that, that has been some fantastic work. My comment on social media, on, on those sort of things would be sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they're effective, and especially when they're starting, they can be brilliant. But other times they can build infrastructure around them and they forget what they're for. And that happens to everybody. It happens to councils. You can have great councils who become basket cases. And we have to understand there is a, there is a, there's a motion to it. And what you've got to do, my view is, it's great to do local stuff, small stuff. You can be really quick and dynamic, but the council needs a red card to pay. And I'll give you an example. With the regatta centre in my borough, I cannot get a kid into a rowing course in my borough. I cannot get kids in there because the regatta centre was set up with enough money and enough bequeath, bequeaths of money from local and from tennis wrestling, the LDDC did, that I can't break them. I've got British rowing or British junior rowing. Got, see, they all want to break into it. We can't do it because it's a nice wee club for the people there. Against that, I've got people that do the most amazing things. No, and play football instead. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's and, about and West Ham. The only other thing I say about the business role, and I think uh, one of the things that we, I think we have to think carefully about our, the words we use. Businesses create jobs. We want to get those jobs. They shouldn't. The, 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 it's not their job to, to, to mould those jobs. Our job, for the public sector, is to get people ready and get them into, to, into work. And we should start with from what businesses, that's what Jeremy does, start with what businesses and skills, what they need in terms of employment, in terms of people, and then help to get those people ready so that we can benefit from it. And just remind you, it's one thing, we talk about business, we don't talk about the big businesses, we don't get into the little businesses, we don't get into the heart of much of the economy. Should remember. Um, do I have time for more questions? No. Um, unfortunately, um, it's been a fantastic debate. I'd really like to thank you, Morris, for another wonderful set of, uh, of points. And I think uh, it was tweeted, actually, Morris was there, started to actually add policy points to what a One Nation economics would be. Robin, just loved your account of a proactive council and a, uh, a repudiation of earlier forms of welfareism that didn't work, but actually a very proactive account. And, particularly interested in the nation of heckling and, and, and productive heckling. Um, what I would like to do is thank you all for coming. Please uh, go onto our Republican website, all of the uh, fringe magazines, and once